the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global uh, Warming. We have a very important hearing uh, today uh, that uh, uh, I think is going to illuminate uh, an issue that uh, has not really been discussed as fully as it should uh, in our country. Uh, natural gas has been called the prince of fossil fuels, and with good reason. It is cleaner burning and emits half the carbon dioxide of coal and one-third uh, the amount of oil. Natural gas supplies a quarter of U.S. energy needs. It is a crucial component in many aspects of the U.S. economy, from home heating to electricity generation to transportation fuel uh, to a feedstock for the chemical industry for everything from fertilizer to pharmaceuticals. Over the last decade, the price of natural gas has increased dramatically, leaving consumers with bills that require a king's ransom to pay. Despite the recent dip, natural gas prices remain two to three times higher than they were at the beginning of this decade. It may be hard to imagine on a hot July day, but winter will be here soon, and many of our most vulnerable families will struggle to pay their heating bills. High prices have allowed the extraction of natural gas using more expensive drilling techniques and spurred new exploration and the discovery of significant new onshore resources. If developed in an environmentally responsible way, U.S. natural gas production could increase substantially. But we must not forget that natural gas like all fossil fuels, is both a finite resource and a contributor to greenhouse gases. Because of that reality, we must use it wisely in a targeted manner, and we must use it efficiently and in ways that help transform our economy to one that is more energy secure and climate friendly. Today, our witnesses will discuss a number of natural gas uses that are already helping to achieve those goals and what might be possible in the near future. For example, the chemical industry produces composites that make our cars stronger and more fuel efficient and insulation that reduces energy use in buildings. Natural gas is helping to supply cleaner electricity to dense urban areas and expand the use of renewable technologies by providing electricity when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining. New, highly efficient, micro-combined heat and power systems will allow homeowners to generate electricity and heat their homes while barely increasing their usage of natural gas. Natural gas vehicles are already displacing gasoline and diesel and improving air quality. The replacement of diesel fleets, such as buses and trucks, with natural gas-powered vehicles has especially helped reduce dangerous air pollution in some of our most polluted cities. Fuel cell vehicles hold the promise of using natural gas more efficiently in the transportation sector. As Congress considers energy policies that will increase our energy independence and help solve global warming, understanding the role of natural gas is critical. The testimony of our witnesses today should help us understand what policies are necessary to best deploy this precious natural resource. Uh, that completes the opening statement of the Chair. And I will turn to recognize the ranking member of the uh, committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Natural gas is one of the most versatile and useful fuel sources in the world. It fires power plants, heats homes, and is a feedstock for many fertilizers and pharmaceutical products. And it can be used as an automotive fuel. Not only that, natural gas is one of the cleanest burning fossil fuels there is. It produces much less CO2 than coal or oil and is almost negligible amounts of nitrogen oxide and sulfur dioxide. Our country needs more of this useful fuel. In fact, there is plenty of it out there for us to use. The United States uses about 23 trillion cubic feet of natural gas a year, 
and the Interior Department's Mineral Management Service believes that there may be as much as 420 trillion cubic feet of natural gas on the outer continental shelf. Unfortunately, 85 percent of this potential natural gas bonanza is off limits to production right now thanks to a congressional moratorium on exploration. But the congressional moratorium on natural gas doesn't just stretch to offshore exploration. <coughs> Excuse me. The testimony of Mark Smith of the Independent Petroleum Association of the Mountain States shows that of the 279 million acres of federal land that have oil and natural gas potential, 145 million of these acres are closed to leasing. Many of those acres are in the natural gas rich Intermountain West. And it's not just the cost of gasoline that's skyrocketing. People are starting to feel the pinch of higher natural gas prices as well. The Energy Information Administration projects that the average cost of natural gas for home heating will rise by more than 40 percent this winter. That's an average of $364 per home, and for most people that's not chump change. And these high costs are having a profound effect on industry, too. The testimony of Rich Wells of the Dow Chemical Company shows that Dow's expenses for natural gas have quadrupled since 2002. With these skyrocketing energy costs, it's a wonder more manufacturers like Dow aren't taking their operations overseas. And did I mention that natural gas is cheaper in China and India? The Democratic governor of Pennsylvania, Ed Rendell, understands the value of natural gas. His state uses more than 500 billion cubic feet a year, which is nearly half of which is for residential uses. Just this April, Governor Rendell opened up 75,000 additional acres of state forest for natural gas exploration while acknowledging the need for cleaner burning fuels and increased energy independence. If the Democratic governor of Pennsylvania can do it, why can't Congress? Republicans are for increasing our domestic energy supplies across the board. We call it our all of the above energy strategy. And yes, that includes renewables like solar and wind power. But as Mr. Smith notes in his testimony, natural gas will have to serve as a backup power source for these renewable energy sources because sometimes the wind doesn't blow and sometimes it's cloudy or even snowy where I come from. From the testimony today, I think it would be clear to everyone how valuable natural gas will be to our economy and our energy security. I think it will be clear to everyone that increasing our domestic supply of natural gas will help improve our economy as well as our environment. What won't be clear is why the House Democratic leadership is blocking a vote on opening these offshore areas for production of this vital natural resources. The sure isn't clear to me. And I'm sure it isn't clear when many people get their home heating bills this winter, and it won't be clear to them either. I urge Speaker Pelosi to let the House vote on this important issue today because the American people can't wait until tomorrow for relief from these high energy prices. I thank the Chair and yield back. Great. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, too, look forward to the conversation here. Uh, natural gas uh, is going to play a critical role. Uh, we're going to have, uh, again and again, pointed out that it uh, has less than half the greenhouse gas emissions of coal. Uh, it uh, has flexibility. It can be, as my good friend from uh, Wisconsin points out, a bridge. Um, uh, it's also uh, going to be important that we uh, capture some of the natural gas that's currently being flared off. Um, I hope that we are also able to focus on ways that we are going to be able to uh, also do a better job of conserving the resource. Uh, I am pleased that uh, we were able to advance an amendment earlier uh, in this Congress uh, to promote decoupling so that gas companies um, uh, are not penalized for conservation. Uh, I would uh, be interested if any of our witnesses have thoughts and observations about how we might ad further adjust the regulatory scheme so that they are actually rewarded for conserving, uh, something that comes up uh, periodically as we have had these conversations. Um, I uh, look forward to an opportunity to explore this in greater length uh, with our witnesses, and I will just sort of yield back at this Beautiful. point so we can get to it. 
gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for the hearing, and I want to welcome all of our witnesses, and I want to thank you for submitting your testimony so that we had it in order to prepare for the hearing uh, today. I think we're all interested in what you have to say. And I, I will say this, the, the chairman mentioned what a precious resource natural gas is. I think that we all realize that. But in order for Americans to benefit from that, it means it's going to require some action on behalf of Congress to enable companies to get to our natural resources to actually be able to move that gas to the marketplace. I think we have to realize that, and we know that that is what our constituents want to see happen. Take, for instance, Memphis, that is in my district in Tennessee. There was a 13.5 percent increase in the natural gas rates from MLGW last year. The prediction is that those could go up 30 percent more this year. For families who are already feeling the pain at the pump, or families who know that their home heating is going to increase as much as their electric power rates are increasing this summer and that their usage is going to change, doing nothing and not addressing the supply issues that we have is not something that they are willing to accept. They want to see some action. They want to see the uh, supply problem solved. And that means that we need to agree on how to best do that. We all know the attributes of the product that you're going to talk about. We know that it is important to the portfolio of options that we have. We know that we as Republicans are supporting an all of the above strategy. We welcome you and we're looking forward to hearing your remarks. Great. General, ladies, time has expired. The chair recognizes the uh, gentlelady from California. Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate uh, having the hearing this, this afternoon and also uh, to thank our witnesses for being here. Um, we know that the U.S. is home to about 3.4 percent of the global reserves of natural gas, and I'm pleased to note that about 2 percent of the proven uh, technically recoverable natural gas reserves in the OCS are currently available for leasing and development. The multiple uses of natural gas as we know, however, pose an interesting alternative to oil. In the district I represent, there is a concerted effort to switch to cleaner burning vehicles, and I'm happy that I was able to secure funding for one of my local cities who actually reconverted so their, their buses uh, to, a, to a natural gas system. So I think the movement is, is happening more and more readily across the country. And I'm eager also to hear today about the efforts of uh, Honda Corporation and hopefully other auto manufacturers will take their lead as well and begin to look at alternative uh, vehicles that can be more useful and, and better proven for our economy as well as uh, for our, our environment. Um, we had a terrible earthquake yesterday in Los Angeles uh, and it, it did affect my area. It was a 5.8, I believe. Um, and we're always worried about um, LNG facilities and safety factors and containment. So that's an issue that I, I personally have of concern. We've had our issues uh, also in, um, with respect to a siting of a potential uh, LNG facility out in, uh, along the coast in Santa Barbara, I believe it was. Um, not Santa Barbara, I'm sorry, um, actually one of the cities close to East Los Angeles where I represent. This is just a lot of issues regarding co consulting the local communities and making sure that input is available uh, where these sightings are going to be placed. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a way that we have to realistically look at, but we also have to look at where we place these particular uh, plants. And, and in my case, uh, we suffer from a, from a large number of egregious uh, projects that have been placed in a city that's been over overburdened um, and many times we refer to it as an environmental justice uh, back you know um, playground for people because they, they cite a lot of uh, different uh, sites there that uh, are, are heavily contaminated and of course our community becomes concerned and affected so just with that I just want to raise those those questions and hopefully have uh, some opportunity to talk to you about that thank you great gentle ladies time has expired the chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon Mr. Walton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome our panelists and guests today. 
Um, obviously, this issue of natural gas and its availability and affordability are paramount on the minds of those of us on this select committee, those of us on the Energy and Air Quality Committee, as well as uh, our constituents. I know in the Northwest, in Oregon, they've announced uh, residential rate increases of 35 to 40 percent for natural gas for this coming heating season. So consumers who are feeling the shell shock at the pump are going to feel it when they get their home heating bill um, this winter. And that is uh, that's going to be yet another shock to the family budget and shock to uh, the economy of our country. I mean, I already hear it when I go out in my 70,000 square mile district and talk to farmers and ranchers who are paying uh, double for their fertilizer costs. Um, when you're seeing $5 diesel to run the vehicles, uh, this is a real problem in this country. And this Congress has been an absolute failure when it comes to addressing access to energy, America's great reserve of energy. Um, I'm preparing to introduce legislation that will open up the Outer Continental Shelf, um, give states new unprecedented authorities out to 12 miles, uh, share the revenue back with those states, but also invest in renewable energy in a way that actually produces real revenue, not some mystical, magical offset or something we come up every year and try and figure out how to extend like the production tax credit, but a real 10-year investment from the royalties in production of geothermal, wind, solar, um, and other alternative resources. It also has a provision in there for conversion of gas guzzlers to natural gas um, in a match grant arrangement, as well as helping those on low income be able to uh, afford their home heating bills and, uh, and, and allow for uh, full payment in our part of the world, the county timber payments, uh, which is a commitment the federal government has, has apparently given up on. We can do that. We don't have to be mired the way we are today, thinking America is going to be third rate to some other country while we ship billions of dollars overseas to countries that hate us. It doesn't have to be that way. This Congress needs to act. We'll have legislation to do that, and I, I just hope that the majority will allow it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the gentlelady from South Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank our witnesses for being here today. I think this is a very important hearing. Uh, I represent uh, the state of South Dakota, an agricultural uh, district, and like Mr. Walden, I hear from uh, the farmers I represent more than anyone else uh, about the cost of natural gas and the need to increase supply uh, because of the essential component of natural gas into nitrogen fertilizer. So unlike those who may believe that farmers are reaping substantial profits given the price of commodities, when you look at the doubling of their fertilizer and fuel costs, uh, they are demanding additional action uh, to increase supply. It also makes me wary, not only for them, but those of my constituents who, through investor-owned utilities, supply electricity with natural gas uh, to those in some of our larger communities and our more rural ones as well. Uh, but these proposals that are seeking to um, propel an increased demand for natural gas before we really grapple with the supply issue. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing from the witnesses today uh, and posing some questions, particularly as it relates to uh, agricultural constituents and not just fossil fuel natural gas, but renewable natural gas. So I think one of the witnesses will uh, talk about it at greater length. So, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and yield back. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Oh, I'm sorry, John. Uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing on an important role that natural gas can play in helping our nation achieve energy security. If our nation is going to be serious about reducing the price of gasoline and lowering our dependence on foreign oil, then natural gas must be an important part of any comprehensive energy policy that Congress pursues. In the first session of the 110th Congress, I introduced bipartisan legislation with Congressman Towns and Congressman Hall which reauthorizes the Department of Energy, Natural Gas Vehicles Research, Development, Demonstration, and Deployment Program for an additional five years. I look forward to hearing testimony from all our witnesses, and especially Aubrey McClendon, Chairman and CEO of Chesapeake Energy. Chesapeake Energy is located in my home state of Oklahoma and is the largest independent producer of natural gas in the United States. Mr. McClendon also serves as the Chairman of the American Clean Skies Foundation who just today announced a groundbreaking study about the supply of natural gas. It is my understanding that this study does not take into account areas that are currently in moratorium. I can only imagine the impact on supplies if we can successfully lift a moratorium on these areas in the west and offshore. I'm glad that our committee will get to hear firsthand about these important findings, and I thank you and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. 
gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I uh, make my prepared remarks, I just wanted to uh, uh, say that contrary to uh, some of the comments from my friends on the other side of the dais, um, I and other members of this uh, caucus, the majority of Democrats, are not against exploiting our uh, resources. We're not against drilling. In fact, we voted for the Drill Act uh, last week, which was unfortunately uh, defeated largely through the opposition of the minority which would have re required oil, oil companies to drill on the 68 million acres plus that they already have leased and permitted and are ready to put the drill bit in the ground, but for some reason they're not doing it. So I just would like to lay that once again to rest that uh, I am also for renewables. Thirty years ago, I co-founded a nonprofit that raised over a million dollars and gave it away in small grants for solar, wind, geothermal and conservation and other alternatives, and I only wish the government had been doing that for the last 30 years or we wouldn't be where we are today, where the skyrocketing prices of oil and gasoline have rightfully garnered a significant amount of attention and debate, in which context it would almost be understandable to call natural gas the forgotten fuel. This would be a drastic mistake, and I'm glad the Committee is taking time to examine the issues surrounding the use and potential of natural gas. Natural gas tends to be cleaner burning than oil and coal, and proportionally we have more of the world's gas resources than we do oil reserves. It makes sense, then, that increasingly the choice for new power generation is natural gas. While natural gas does have advantages, it would be dangerous to delude ourselves into thinking it can be a cure-all for our energy crisis, because it's also an important feedstock for chemical production, fertilizer, and a number of other uses. We have to be careful that we factor in the impact of increased demand on these commodities as we discuss how to best capitalize on our natural gas resources. Likewise, we must make sure that as we contemplate developing natural gas resources, we fully understand and address the impacts of exploration. My district in the Hudson Valley of New York State is very close to areas that are considered part of the Marcellus Shale Gas Reserve. Much of the discussion about exploring the reserve has centered on the method of hydrofracking, which could have severe water use and environmental impacts. I look forward to hearing the thoughts of our panel and how we can make the most effective and responsible use of our natural gas resources. And I yield back. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman uh, from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to associate myself with the comments of my colleague, Mr. Hall, uh, the, the um, preface he made before his comments about uh, natural gas. Uh, I would also like to welcome our distinguished uh, guest, and uh, we appreciate your, your presence here today. Uh, natural gas uh, is cleaner, and I had to do this argument last night uh, with a group of people pushing uh, something else, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's much cleaner than, than coal. Uh, it uses about half the carbon, uh, releases about half the carbon emissions uh, of coal, and it has uh, the potential of becoming a viable replacement for coal to heat and, and cool homes and to power vehicles. Uh, I'm always uh, fascinated by uh, and, and uh, with, have much appreciation for uh, the buses that move up and down the streets of the District of Columbia and they have the, the lettering on the side, uh, this bus is uh, clean, is powered by clean natural gas. And uh, I, I've, I've also uh, made attempts to get our uh, Area Transportation Authority uh, interested in trying to get uh, more uh, buses that are fueled by natural gas uh, in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, the collection of natural gas is an invasive process and increased demand could encourage calls for drilling uh, in protected areas. Uh, additionally, natural gas is a limited and finite resource. Uh, the supply that exists within our borders today will last only until it's all gone. And after all the natural gas is utilized by our homes and our vehicles, we'll still have to find a new source of, of energy. And so uh, I think realistically we need to look at natural gas uh, as a temporary uh, solution, uh, and to leave such a fate to future generations uh, is a morally bankrupt thought. Uh, I think it is our responsibility uh, now to have the vision uh, to do those things that will enable future generations and even their progeny 
uh, to inherit a, a cleaner planet. And so I look forward to hearing what our witnesses have to say about this critical issue and what the future of natural gas is for our country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. <clears throat> Great. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. Now we'll turn to our uh, panel and uh, recognize our first witness, Mr. Aubrey McClendon. He is co-founder and serves as chairman of the board and CEO of Chesapeake Energy Corporation. Chesapeake Energy is the largest independent producer of natural gas and is responsible for 4 percent of domestic natural gas production. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. McClendon. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to discuss the great promise of natural gas in the United States. I'm Aubrey McClendon, CEO of Chesapeake Energy and, I'm, and also chairman of the American Clean Skies Foundation. Today we issued a groundbreaking new study which proves that America's natural gas resources will last for at least the next 100 years. We are a public company founded in 1989. We do produce 4 percent of America's natural gas. We drill 9 percent of America's uh, new natural gas wells. In 2008, we will invest $10 billion to develop new reserves of natural gas right here in America. If there's one message I'd like to effectively communicate today, it's that America is at the beginning of a great natural gas boom, and this boom can largely solve our present energy crisis. The domestic gas industry, through new technology, has found enough natural gas right here in America to heat homes, generate electricity, make chemicals, plastics, and fertilizers, and most importantly, potentially fuel millions of cars and trucks for decades to come. This great new period of discovery in our industry has largely gone unnoticed by the media and most policymakers. Our industry has recently learned how to extract natural gas from massive rock formations called gas shales buried deep below the Earth's surface. For example, just a month ago, Chesapeake announced a new area in Louisiana and Texas called the Haynesville Shale, which was featured two days ago on the front page of the New York Times, that we believe will become the nation's largest gas field and the fourth largest gas field in the world. In just the past month since we've made that announcement, natural gas prices have declined by about 35 percent. Just by itself, we believe this one field has enough gas to meet the country's gas needs for 20 years. I believe natural gas can be the driving force for how Congress can take bold action to free our country from the death grip of high prices for imported oil thereby improving our economy, enhancing national security, and helping the environment. How might Congress lead us to that freedom? It's actually very easy. All you have to do is provide incentives for gasoline station owners to add a CNG pump, provide incentives for homeowners with natural gas already piped into their homes to add a home refueling device, provide incentives for manufacturers to make cars and trucks that run on CNG, and finally, provide American consumers with incentives to buy new CNG vehicles or retrofit their existing vehicles to CNG. Why should you provide incentives to switch to CNG? It's simple. Nothing less than the survival of the American way of life is at stake. Oil production around the world has stagnated while demand in developing countries is rising rapidly. The result is that the days of cheap oil are over, and America has been left holding the bag a bag into which we put $700 billion each year of our natural, national wealth and export it to various countries around the world. We are on the road to national bankruptcy, and we must change our ways. The good news is it's easy to do. We don't need a new fuel, we don't need new technology, and we don't need hundreds of billions of dollars. All you have to do is modify or replace today's gasoline and diesel engines with engines that run on CNG. And that's natural gas that costs half the price of gasoline, is more than two-thirds cleaner, is made in America, and we have plenty of it. Imagine tomorrow if you could announce a new energy plan that would, in one stroke, cut your constituents' gasoline bills in half, reduce our oil imports, improve our air quality, enhance national security, strengthen the dollar, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and create tens of thousands of new jobs in the U.S. I believe your upcoming re-election chances would be even higher than they already are if that were possible. In closing, I, in closing, I would like to offer my 100 percent support for Representative Sullivan's bill as well as the Emanuel Bourne new alternative transportation to give American 
Solutions Act, or more simply the Nat Gas Act, which was introduced on July 22nd, that would start us down the road of freedom from foreign oil. I urge each of you to become a co-sponsor of this legislation and lead America out of our energy wilderness into a brighter future fueled by clean, affordable, abundant American natural gas. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. McClendon, and thank you so much for dramatically increasing the likelihood of the re-election of Mr. Sullivan. We appreciate that. <laughs> um, let me now turn to recognize our second witness, Mark Smith, the Executive Director of the Independent Petroleum Association of Mountain States, a nonprofit trade association responsible for oil and natural gas development in the Intermountain West. Mr. Smith has also worked in research, strategic planning, and government affairs. We welcome you, Mrs. Smith. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. This is a very uh, important and timely hearing. I'm here today on behalf of the Independent Petroleum Association of Mountain States, uh, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization representing more than 400 independent oil and natural gas producers and related companies committed to environmentally committed to environmentally responsible oil and natural gas development. Armed with new technologies and a new generation of high-tech savvy employees, America's independents are producing energy from complex reservoirs that were thought to be uneconomic just 10 years ago. This Congress could help put America on a path to greater energy independence and a sustainable energy future by lifting restrictions on OCS drilling and addressing the barriers that are limiting development of new supplies of oil and natural gas in the Intermountain West. As the cleanest burning fossil fuel, natural gas will also play an increasingly important role in, carbon, in a carbon constrained world as an essential part of any plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. If we increase demand for natural gas, we need to have corresponding policies to plan for the development of new supplies. Natural gas producers don't need special subsidies. They need access to the places where energy resources are found and a predictable regulatory and tax structure in order to make long-term investment decisions that ensure uninterrupted supply. Some of the most promising areas for future development of natural gas are the Outer Continental Shelf and the onshore federal lands in the Intermountain West. In total, 279 million acres of federal land have oil and natural gas potential. Of these acres, 145 million are closed to leasing and another 20 million are inaccessible because of surface occupancy or, or ground disturbance is prohibited. The Intermountain West is possibly best poised to help the U.S. meet its near-term energy needs. The, uh, the region already supplies more than 25 percent of our nation's natural gas while occupying less than 1 percent of federal lands in the region. Production from this region has grown by nearly 1 billion cubic feet of, a day this year and has grown more than 50 percent in the last decade. Recently, there have been misleading claims that U.S. energy companies are not actively developing federal lands they have already under lease. As a remedy, congressional leaders have proposed use it or lose it legislation in the Drill Act. The use it or lose it approach is the wrong approach and would not solve the real problems that exist with developing federal leases which are the extensive restrictions, expensive permitting requirements, bureaucratic delays, and frivol frivolous lawsuits that hinder timely development of American energy supplies. Drilling well, new wells is and will continue to be critical to maintaining supply. To highlight this point, consider the fact that 50 percent of the natural gas we use today comes from wells that were drilled in the last three and a half years. In fact, according to the Cambridge Energy Re Research Associates, natural gas drilling in the Intermountain West will need to increase 75 percent over the next 10 years to sustain current production levels. If Congress increases the demand for natural gas by moving forward with cap and trade legislation to reduce CO2 emissions, it should carefully consider policies that ensure timely access to some of the most promising areas for future supply. Ignoring the current policies that contribute to bureaucratic delays and limit access to federal lands will only serve to deepen our nation's energy challenge. Please consider the following list of policy recommendations as tangible near-term steps that can be taken to ensure supply. Congress should increase the budget for the Bureau of Land Management oil and gas program so that the agency has the necessary staff and resources to process applications for permits to drill and rights of way for gathering and pipeline and infrastructure. 
Congress should consider ways to shorten the time frame for processing APDs and other environmental analysis. The, the bureaucratic delays and runaway costs associated with environmental studies provide no additional environmental protections. Instead, they artificially restrict the development of new supplies of oil and natural gas. Congress should not delay areas with significant natural, the leasing of areas with significant natural gas resources. Legislation currently pending before Congress, such as the Rhone Plateau Oil and Gas Leasing Improvement Act of 2008, would place significant restrictions on the development of new natural gas supplies on the former naval oil shale reserves. Congress should carefully consider how the creation of new wilderness areas will limit the ability of new, uh, uh, America's ability to meet future energy needs. The Red Rocks Wilderness Act and the Colorado Wilderness Act of 2007 present specific threats to some of our nation's largest supplies of natural gas. Congress should also consider limiting the ability of obstructionist groups to stop leasing, exploration, and development on federal lands. And Congress should appropriate the statutory, statutorily mandated funds for research and development of new technologies through Section 999 program. If you could summarize, Mr. Smith. As this committee examines the daunting tasks of ensuring America's energy independence and addressing the important issue of climate change, independent oil and gas producers stand ready to help. Thank you for uh, allowing us to appear today. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, next, we welcome Mr. Clay Harris, a geologist by training and the CEO and president of Suez LNG North America, an international energy company that is one of the main LNG importers in the U.S. market. Please begin whenever you are ready. Thank you, Chairman Markey and members of the committee for inviting me to present testimony regarding LNG and for your leadership on the important issues of energy independence and global warming. I will concentrate on three points. First, LNG can contribute substantially to a region's energy supply. As you know, Mr. Chairman, our terminal in Everett meets 20 percent of New England's natural gas demand. We supply the fuel for one of the region's largest power plants, which can generate enough electricity for 1.5 million homes. If LNG resources were not available in New England, supplies would be far tighter and consumers would suffer. <coughs> We are also starting construction of our new offshore regasification system near Gloucester, which is designed to provide an additional 400 million cubic feet a day to the New England market. In Florida, we are working to complete the permitting process for a similar offshore regasification facility near Fort Lauderdale. This project could ultimately bring as much as 1 billion cubic feet a day of natural gas to the Florida market. We believe that wherever there is a regasification facility, LNG keeps downward pressure on prices by helping to diversify and increase a region's energy supply. Second, LNG alone cannot meet all of our growing needs for natural gas. We view LNG as an important energy source in addition to other North America natural gas supplies, not as a substitute for them. As a nation, we need to do be a better job of developing our natural resource base, in part because traditional fuel sources are going to be the backbone of the energy system for some time. We at Suez are fully committed to renewable energy with about 430 megawatts of renewable capacity either installed or under construction and another 2,000 megawatts in development. But the data is clear. Last year, renewables accounted for 4.4 quadrillion BTUs of the more than 101 quads that we consumed. By comparison, Fossil fuels accounted for 86 quads of energy last year. Consequently, we believe that we will need more supplies of natural gas, including LNG, in the future. In the last few years, expansions and new construction have raised LNG regasification capacity in North America to around 14 billion cubic feet a day. By 2015, that number will be more than 22 billion cubic feet a day. With respect to actual imports, even though 2000 import, 2008 imports of LNG will likely be only half of 2007 imports, they are projected to return to 2007 levels next year and continue to increase. EIA has projected that by 2030 we could bring as much as 2.8 TCF of LNG into the United States, which could be as much as 10 percent of the total gas demand. On a related note, it is important for policymakers who are concerned with our energy security and carbon emissions to look at opportunities to further improve the use of natural gas and electric power generation. Right now, natural gas accounts for about 20 percent of electricity generation, 
and it is clear that it is being looked to as the bridge fuel for power generation for the foreseeable future. Unfortunately, in some regions, particularly those that have not adopted competitive and fully transparent wholesale power markets, older, less efficient natural gas power plants continue to operate, while newer, more efficient and cleaner natural gas power plants remain idle or underutilized. Such inefficient use of natural gas not only increases emissions and wastes natural gas, but increases the electricity cost to the consumer. Third, I would like to address the international aspects of LNG. While LNG is a global commodity, it is premature to talk about a world gas price. In reality, there are several regional markets for natural gas, and the prices in each one vary according to local circumstances. Additionally, on, additionally, on a global scale, there is more regasification capacity than there is liquefaction capacity. That's the nature of the LNG business model. More regasification capacity provides flexibility in supply and price responsiveness to markets. That also means that growing, a growing proportion of the LNG marketplace, perhaps as much as 20 percent, consists of divertible cargoes. Finally, the presence of LNG means that there are some interrelationships between the regional natural gas markets. For instance, when Japan's gas demand spiked last autumn due to a shutdown of nuclear units, divertible LNG went to Japan. Similarly, when the price of natural gas in Great Britain dropped last spring and summer, divertible LNG wound up being shipped to the United States. Those transfers simply reflect market dynamics. Thank you again for inviting me. We think LNG can be and is an important part of the energy supply equation for the United States. I look forward to answering any questions you might have and working with the committee on these important issues. Thank, thank, you, you. Mr. thank you, Mr. Harris, very much. Uh, now, turning now from natural gas production to its use, we welcome Mr. David Manning, the Executive Vice President of U.S. External Affairs at National Grid, an international electricity and gas supplier. He has previously served as the Executive Vice President and Chief Environmental Officer of Keyspan, one of the nation's largest gas distributors. And early in his career, he served as Deputy Minister for Energy of the Province of Alberta in Canada. So we welcome you, Mr. Manning. Whenever you're ready, please begin. If you can move in closer to the microphone, please. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. And if I could speak to Ms. Turner now. Yes, please. That's better. I apologize. If I could speak with the mic from the consumer's end of the, uh, of the, of the pipeline. <clears throat> Just a quick word about National Grid. We are one of the largest uh, distributors of natural gas we, and, and electricity. We have about 9,000 miles of transmission. We serve about 15 million people. We move 718 billion cubic feet of gas per year to generators and to homes and to businesses, which accounts for about 3 percent of the U.S. supply. So obviously these issues are very critical to us. Um, we have spent about $1.5 billion in energy efficiency programs in New England alone. Uh, energy efficiency is obviously one of our primary uh, uh, missions as a company, uh, both on the gas and electric side. So we do believe that while natural gas is critically important and offers a great advantage in terms of its CO2 emissions, it is also the fuel <coughs> excuse me, which facilitates the greatest opportunity for energy efficiency technology. So if I could just go a little bit further, uh, the, the generation side of natural gas is critically important to the Northeast. Forty percent of the generation in New England is now running on natural gas, slightly more than that. In New York, it is probably about 12 percent pure natural gas, but about 24 percent of the plants in New York State run on some combination of gas and oil. We are the largest today, we are the largest independent power generator in New York State, and all of our plants, of course, are running on natural gas currently, which is better for the environment and also has a price advantage. So it is critically important, but more important than that, and of course, if I could just repeat, and I know that the Chairman brought this up, pounds per billion cubic uh, billion BTUs of, of, uh, of, of energy, 117,000 for natural gas, 164,000 for oil. 208,000 for coal. This is not to say that we shouldn't try and drive our clean coal technologies and shouldn't find ways to improve the use of all these energy fuels, because as every member has pointed out, your constituents are being afflicted by high energy costs. So I think National Grid's agenda is we need to first and foremost drive energy efficiency and, and of all fuels, and the fuels that we do use not only must be available, but they must be used in the best 
way possible, both for the environment and also in terms of energy efficiency to reduce our dependence on imported fuels. So turning to electricity just again, not only do you have the opportunity for combined cycle, cogeneration, um, there is a wonderful plant in Oregon. I had the opportunity to, to cut the ribbon in a former life, as the Chairman pointed out. Um, natural gas comes in, runs a generator. The waste heat from that generator runs a second turbine. Two sources of power go to Spokane. That, of course, is cogeneration. So you have two sources of power. The waste heat from that second, uh, that is now there is still a waste heat from the generator, goes out the back end. And so those of you who haven't been, Idaho and Oregon have a lot of potato uh, farms, all run by satellite. It's, it's, it's wonderful to see. Blows the, the, the waste steam, the waste heat from that steam blows the skin off the potato, slices, fries, freezes, and cycles back into the plant. Now you have taken a power gener generator, generator into a much higher efficiency level. And of course, that same kind of technology is available at homes, businesses, uh, with technologies like combined heat and power, which of course are driven primarily and best by natural gas. Honda has the best example we have seen, which is free watt, which is a unit for the home, which we can, we can discuss in a moment. Also, natural gas vehicles, uh, we have tremendous expertise. I believe as a company, this has been an issue for us for many years. Uh, Mass Bay Transit, we have converted over a third of their fleet. One hundred percent of the vehicles in the Long Island, Long Island bus fleet are operating now in natural gas. Uh, we have a fleet of Honda natural gas vehicles for our customer service. We have our own corporate fleet of natural gas vehicles. Our current, our, our benefits, however, have been primarily in fleets, and our current focus is on school buses. We have converted the entire Long Beach School Division because those school buses not only are running more efficiently, but they are also improving the air quality of the passengers, which we think is a critically important opportunity. Uh, not to, to uh, leave aside, however, electric vehicles, because again, our point is these are, these are prime fuels, they are uh, premium fuels. We must use them efficiently. We have a combined cycle plant, the most efficient plant in New York. It has not stopped since the day it started in 2004, but between the hours of 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., it drops from 250 megawatts to 160. So the idea of plugging in your plug-in hybrid to a windmill is a great idea. But in the near term, plugging into Ravenswood will dramatically improve the air quality just on that point alone. Look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Manning. Our next witness is Rich Wells, the Vice President of Energy at the Dow Chemical Company, one of the world's leading manufacturers of chemicals and plastics. Dow is committed to corporate sustainability and since 1990 has reduced its emissions of greenhouse gas emissions by 20 percent. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. Wells. Whenever you are ready, please begin. If you can turn on the microphone and move it up uh, close to you. It's on. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Markey, Representative Sensenbrenner. Can you and, please and pull in the microphone a little bit more close? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Chairman Markey, Representative Sensenbrenner and other members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide our views on natural gas and its role in the future and energy climate change policies of our country. First, I would like to address the role natural gas plays for Dow. As the Nation's largest chemicals and plastics producer, Dow uses natural gas and natural gas liquids as both a fuel and a raw material. For its global operations, Dow uses the energy equivalent of 850,000 barrels of oil each and every day. Of this total, approximately half is in the United States. Dow converts natural gas and natural gas liquids into more than 3,000 products essential to our economy and our citizens' quality of life. These products serve as building blocks for everything from pharmaceuticals, insulation, electronic materials, fertilizers, and much more. The rising price of natural gas has had a dramatic impact on Dow's operating costs. In 2002, our total annual energy and feedstock bill was $8 billion. For this year, it is projected to be $32 billion. As a result, we have taken a number of actions necessary to sustain our operations and retain the ability to invest in our future. Let me give you some examples of what we have done. Our relentless focus on energy efficiency has saved over 1,400 trillion BTUs of energy since 1994. That is enough to power every home in California for 16 months. We have shut down over 90 facilities since 2003. In the last two months, we have announced, announced price increases totaling 45 percent. These increases will be reflected in the prices consumers pay for items such as trash bags, diapers, detergent, food, and many other daily household items. 
We are pursuing alternative and renewable energy and feedstock projects. As an example, we are building a world-scale plastics plant in Brazil where polyethylene will be made from sugarcane. And finally, we are preferentially investing in other parts of the world where energy costs are considerably lower. In fact, Dow has announced projects in Brazil, China, Kuwait, Libya, and Saudi Arabia. These investments will create 10,000 direct and 60,000 indirect jobs. Many of these jobs could have been created here in the U.S., but for the high and volatile cost of natural gas. We believe natural gas is of greatest value as a raw material for value-added products. At Dow, we turned $10 billion worth of natural gas and natural gas liquids into $45 billion of value-added products each year. Chemistry creates wealth by converting precious resources like natural gas into value-added products essential to our way of life. With additional proposed uses of natural gas, the industrial sector will become the shock absorber in the form of demand destruction. Demand destruction is a sterile economic term for job loss. In fact, with natural gas prices increasing more than 460 percent over the last eight years, our country's manufacturing sector has lost 3.7 million jobs. As our country becomes more concerned with energy security and reducing global warming, we, must, we run the risk of dramatically increasing demand for natural gas. As an example, natural gas in the power sector could ramp up dramatically under a climate change policy that does not rapidly deploy nuclear technology and carbon capture and sequestration. To prevent this, we recommend that Congress enact comprehensive energy policy that addresses high prices, dependence on foreign sources of energy, and climate change. We believe this can best be accomplished by focusing on aggressive energy efficiency measures, increasing and diversifying domestic energy supplies, including more natural gas production, further developing alternative and renewable sources of energy, and passing environmentally effective and economically sustainable climate change legislation. Recent proposals, such as the Pickens Plan, have some positive elements, like increased wind and solar power generation. However, we are concerned that adding new uses for natural gas, such as in transportation, will create new and relatively inelastic demand that we may not be able to meet without high prices and further demand destruction in the industrial sector. In conclusion, the U.S. needs a comprehensive, sustainable energy policy. Simply increasing demand for natural gas without addressing the supply issue is not a sustainable policy. It seems that members of Congress are talking past each other on energy policy. We need serious action on both supply and demand. It is a need that cries out for bipartisan solutions. I thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's discussion. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Wells. And our final witness is Mr. John German, the Manager of Environmental and Energy Analysis for the American Honda Motor Company. Honda is the only company currently offering a compressed natural gas passenger vehicle, the Civic GX, in the United States. Since its introduction in 1998, both EPA and the American Council for Energy Efficient Economy have ranked it as one of the greenest cars in America. We welcome you, Mr. German, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Um, and uh, we'll just wait a second here so you can get your, uh, your props <laughs> set up. <laughs> and uh, taking a page out of your book, Mr. Chairman. I, I think it's, it's already um, it's already got my attention. I, I, I like props, and uh, if you we have a little bit of an obstructed view there. If you can pull that out a little bit further, all right, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, please begin. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Good afternoon. I appreciate appreciate the opportunity to appear today to discuss Honda's work with natural gas. I request that my full statement be submitted for the record. Honda believes there is no single solution to America's dependence on petroleum and global warming. As a result, we are dedicated to advancing and implementing a variety of fuels and technologies. Our objective is to introduce technologies that lower emissions, improve energy conservation, and increase fuel economy while meeting the needs of our customers and of society. One such, one such technology is our dedicated natural gas vehicle, the Civic GX. It is the only natural gas vehicle producer sold in America. Natural gas offers significant benefits when used as a transportation fuel, as it operates cleanly and efficiently in internal combustion engines and works in a variety of vehicle applications. Natural gas also has low upstream emissions and a lower ratio of carbon to energy output than petroleum, 
which reduces greenhouse gas emissions. First introduced in 1997, the GX is produced at Honda's East Liberty Manufacturing Plant in Ohio. It has been called the cleanest vehicle ever tested by the US EPA. Historically, our sales have been between 500 and 1,000 vehicles per year, but Civic GX demand is now at an all-time high, and the market is growing due to the combination of high gasoline prices, concerns about energy security, and the introduction of a home refueling station. The price of the Civic GX is approximately $25,000, which is about $7,000 more than a comparable gasoline engine Civic. Part of this price differential is offset by a federal tax credit of up to $4,000. The price premium due primarily to the increased expense of key components, such as the special tank and fuel system, could be lowered somewhat with increased volume. The GX has a range of up to 220 miles on an 8-gallon gasoline equivalent fuel capacity. Compared to plug-in hybrids, fuel cell, and battery electric vehicles, the cost increment for gasoline, I'm sorry, cost to make up for natural gas vehicles is much less. Due to infrastructure constraints, Honda's initial market for the Civic, Civic GX was fleets. However, with the development of a home refueling device known as Phil, Honda has begun to market, to market the vehicle to retail customers. Phil, which is illustrated up here, that's a, a full-size photo, taps into the consumer's residential natural gas line, connects to the vehicle, and fills the tank overnight. We have found that the convenience of home refueling is a major attraction to many customers. Mile for mile, natural gas is much less expensive than gasoline, particularly at residential rates. Every ga gallon of equivalent of natural gas displaces one gallon of gasoline and cuts CO2 emissions by about 25 percent. Honda's experience with natural gas vehicles also serves as a pathway to hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. The physical properties of hydrogen and natural gas are similar, and so are many of the components. With natural gas being the base fuel in many cases for producing hydrogen, Honda is testing an innovative home energy station that generates hydrogen from natural gas. Honda's home energy station, developed in cooperation with Plug Power of New York, makes efficient use of a home's existing natural gas supply for production of hydrogen while providing heat and electricity to the home. Our fourth generation station is currently deployed at our Torrance campus and is used to fuel the Clarity, our new fuel cell vehicle. Incidentally, last week, Honda leased its first Clarity to a retail customer in California. We'll be leasing 200 additional Clarity vehicles to individuals over the next several years at the rate of $600 per month for 36 months. Honda also makes a micro combined heat and power system for the home. And this is the free watt system illustrated on the other one. It's a home natural gas cogeneration unit that produces about a third less carbon dioxide emissions than a conventional heating system with electricity provided from the grid. The product is marketed in New England and sold through a joint venture known as Climate Energy. The system combines two technologies, an advanced furnace provided by ECR of Utica, New York, and a natural gas fire generator produced by Honda. Economic viability of the system would be further increased if the electric grid could accept excess el electricity generated by free water. Our energy and global climate challenges are so immense, we are going to need rapid deployment and implementation of as many feasible technologies as possible. Although supplies of natural gas are not unlimited, natural gas vehicles are one of a number of important near-term technologies. Nas natural gas may also be a core fuel for what may, may be our best long-term technology, fuel cell vehicles with hydrogen extracted from natural gas. This concludes my statement. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. That uh, completes the time for uh, the opening statements from the witnesses. I think we'll have time for Mr. Sensenbrenner and for myself to ask questions. So I will begin, and then we will come back right after the roll call to uh, recognize other members. So the chair will recognize himself. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. McClendon and Mr. Smith, you both mentioned in your testimony that U.S. natural gas production is up while demand has remained relatively flat. Uh, but prices are still high. Uh, and many American families are already worried about paying for their heating bills this winter. Will prices come down substantially as um, more and more of this natural gas goes into the system um, and uh, will uh, expanded use of natural gas 
uh, as we've heard from Mr. Wells in the vehicle sector, uh, sector uh, have an impact on pricing for home heating uh, for home um, uh, heating purposes uh, if, if uh, there is that expanded demand for it. Mr. McClendon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first thing I would say is that gas production has actually been increasing over the last three years at a compounded rate of 6 percent. Over the last three years? Over the last three years on a mm -hmm. compounded uh, rate. Before then, for the last for five or six years before then, gas production was flat to slightly declining. This year looks like we'll have the industry's best year uh, in modern history. We'll be up probably 9 percent, and that's the equivalent of a 4 or 5 BCF a day of new production in the U.S. So do we have enough natural gas to meet all these, all these new needs for natural gas? We see demand going up for natural gas for electricity. Um, certainly it's become harder and harder to build a coal plant these days. It's difficult to build a nuclear power plant. And our view on that is simply that gas is there, it's clean, it's affordable, and, and we think it ought to be used. With regard to whether or not there's enough to fuel the uh, uh, automobile uh, industry, right now if you were to move 2 million cars to uh, natural gas, that would be about 1 percent of the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, car fleet. We think that would increase natural gas demand by about 0.75 percent. So the Emanuel um, Boren bill seeks to increase demand or uh, it seeks to increase uh, the amount of cars in the U.S. that run on natural gas to 10 percent. Um, we think that that would require only about a 7.5 to 8 percent increase in demand for natural gas. And again, that's over 10 years. And in the context this year, our industry will increase production by 9 percent. Let me talk. Can I talk yeah. uh, for a second about uh, using natural gas to generate electricity? Um, we will have, in some manner, shape, or form, uh, legislation that passes here over the next couple of years that uh, is a cap and trade system that puts some price on uh, carbon. Um, how much uh, of these new discoveries can be used in order to make it possible to retire dirty, uh, old coal generating plants, um, and uh, and as a result help us to meet uh, whatever commitments uh, the United States makes in the Copenhagen uh, round? Well, the American Clean Skies. Clean Skies Foundation today uh, released a study that had been performed by Navigant Consulting, uh, which the authors of that report have concluded um, that over the next 20 years you could begin to retire um, the dirtiest of coal-fired power plants and, and not affect the price of natural gas, again, because of the amount of production increase that we have. Do you know how many megawatts they're talking about in terms of retired uh, coal-fired plants? I don't, but you have about 500,000 megawatts of installed power. You use about 400,000 of it in all. On a daily basis. Right, yeah. all incremental, um, most incremental megawatts. So is it possible that 50,000 new megawatts of natural gas Gener electrical generation or 100,000 new megawatts of electrical right, generation right is now, possible? Right now, 20 percent of all electricity is made from natural right. gas, and that only consumes about 25 percent of natural gas in the U.S. So if you're increasing natural gas by 5 to 10 percent per year, you can add tens of thousands of megawatts a year and not impact. So is, is it possible, in other words, to reduce from 50 percent the electrical generating capacity for coal in the United, in the United States down to, let's say, 35 percent? And to increase the natural gas electrical generation from 20 percent up to 35 percent of our total needs and as a result meet the big climate change goal that we would have. Three years ago I would have said no. Mm -hmm. Today I say yes because of the technological breakthroughs that has occurred in drilling for natural gas into these shale deposits. So with the supply available, how long do you think it would take to make a transition like that? I'm not an expert in that. What I'm an expert in doing is telling you that I believe that we can increase the supply of natural You're gas. You're saying the supply will be there to at least 5 percent per year. How the market decides to use that, whether mm -hmm. it be for cars, whether it be for electricity, whether it be for more plastics and chemicals, uh, I, I can't really comment on. But I think the surprise that I have for people today is that the technological breakthrough that we have developed in finding gas from shales changes everything about what you think about natural gas scarcity in America. Thank you, Mr. McClendon. Uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner is recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as the Chairman knows, I am a sharp critic of what I refer to as cap and tax because it is an indirect tax that people will pay through their utility bills and at the pump and practically every place else. Uh, 
We've heard today from many of the witnesses that if there is a cap and tax proposal passed by the Congress, there will be a huge incentive for utilities that generate electricity from coal to convert to natural gas uh, because they won't have to buy as many carbon credits uh, 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 by using natural gas. And that's going to increase the demand in natural gas and put pressure on increased prices. With that in mind, um, I do not share my chairman's feeling that cap and tax is inevitable. But if it does pass, uh, does that increase the urgency of lifting the mor moratorium on offshore drilling? And even if it didn't, I'd like to ask all of the witnesses simply to give me a yes or no answer of whether they support lifting the moratorium on offshore drilling right away, starting with you, Mr. McClendon. We don't drill offshore. We don't drill in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, but I'm for all things American, so I think we should develop um, all of our American uh, assets. But I will tell you that this new surge of shale production comes from private lands, and I think it's something we all need to recognize that there's a lot of gas okay. coming out of some traditional The clock is ticking both across the <laughs> way and here. Mr. Smith? Uh, policies that uh, call for increased demand without corresponding plans to increase supply are a recipe for disaster. We absolutely believe that we should be developing all of our energy resources in the U.S., especially in the Intermountain West and the Outer, outer Continental Shelf. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Harris? Uh, sir, just a simple yes. Okay, Mr. Manning. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wells. Answer, yes. Okay, Mr. German. Yeah, I, I, um, it's a little different. We produce vehicles. We're not in the fuel generation side, but the Honda is certainly on record as saying that uh, we need to reduce consumption, and uh, and all, all ways to, to help do that uh, should be on the table. Okay. Can the record just at this point? Can the record just at this point? Note that the chairman could have had six people who took the opposite point of view, so it just showed the open-mindedness of the chairman <laughs> in the construction of this panel. Well, uh, we will excuse uh, the mistake the chairman may feel that he made on this, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. We're going to take a. Uh, how, how much time is left? Does anyone know on the roll call right now? It's about six minutes. I, what I'm going to do is recognize the gentleman from Oregon, uh, Mr. Blumenauer, and pass the gavel to him, and uh, he can make a decision as to how long he wants his question period to go. Thank you for your courtesy, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I do appreciate uh, the, the gist of the presentations here, and particularly, Mr. McClendon, starting with what you were talking about in terms of increased supply. Uh, there, as you see, there's a modest uh, difference of opinion around here in terms of point of emphasis. Uh, there has been great uh, the evidence we've received from the administration is that uh, the majority of the Outer Continental Shelf is already available. There's only about 2 percent of the 7 percent of the gas that is off limits and that uh, basically nothing is going to happen for 20 or 30 years. It's going to profoundly affect supply here. So there are a couple of choices. We can spend all our time and energy battling over something that may happen 15 or 20 or 30 years from now, burn a lot of political energy, or we can focus on what you've been talking about here, maximize supply, what I mentioned in my opening statement about providing incentives for people to actually conserve and reward people for, for stretching it more. Uh, and be able to talk about the amazing flexibility that the product that you're talking about here today offers for the next 10 or 15 years uh, while we're still increasing domestic supply, while we can deal with things that don't have people at each other's throats, and be able to actually make some progress. Um, I am curious if, um, starting with you, sir, if you have some thought that maybe we might be able to um, have an energy policy for this century that talks about substitution, for example. And why in the world would we have anybody heating um, hot water with electricity today from coal-fired plants uh, until we deal with 
Uh, I'm trying to get a sense of uh, if you have some thoughts about how we might be able to get past the knife fight and the dueling statistics that won't make any difference for 20 years and maybe get at what you're talking about here to change the system, provide the incentives and make that transition. I believe my role in, in this hearing and in this, in this world um, is to do one thing and that's to increase the supply of affordable, clean, burning American natural gas. I'm not an expert on access. I'm not an expert on offshore drilling. What I can offer is that our company is going to spend $10 billion this year to increase our number one position in the industry from uh, by 25 percent. Our production this year is going to increase by 25 percent. Uh, we produce 4 percent of, uh, of our nation's natural gas. I'm here to testify that from existing sources, areas of production, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, that there are enormous new resources of natural gas that, in my view, will increase the supply of natural gas in this country for at least the next, next decade by a minimum of 5 percent per year. Okay. What the market wants to do with that in terms of making cleaner cars, making cleaner electricity, Great. I'll leave that to the market. But yeah. I will tell you that it okay. will take a while for people to adjust to this right. new supply I'm sorry, surplus. I just want to, I want to move to Mr. Manning. I appreciate what you're saying, but I, this is, I think it's very important if we're going to be able to roll the nothing that uh, we are hearing uh, indicates that uh, some of the peripheral things are going to make any difference for 10 or 15 years. But you're looking for policy changes that will make a difference almost immediately. And you have confidence that we can do this within the range of supply? I'm sorry, I missed it again. The tankless water heater, which we now have to source from Europe, right. gives you a 70 percent reduction in, in, in heat energy to heat water, and it only heats water when you need it. So there's a tremendous amount of low-hanging fruit out there, and I think you're right, decoupling and those sorts of policy initiatives. But like the OCS debate, that starts to bring in the states and the opportunity for the federal government to work with the states and to create some sort of a set of rules with a, a, a transparent, clear understanding of how to get this stuff done, the cheapest power plant is the one that you never build. Yeah. You know, I, I appreciate your courtesy. I apologize that I am running off to vote and leave you to your own devices. But I would like to follow up with each of you uh, about the policy framework that we should be doing here in the next 10 years. One of the things we are advocating is uh, with uh, Senator Obama, with the House Democratic leadership and trying to make it part of a discussion is an infrastructure plan for this century that is realistic about what we do with energy and making these pieces, particularly as it relates to natural gas, be able to coax as much out of that as possible. And I would be very interested in being able to explore with you the sorts of air, your comfort level are being able to go ahead for the next dozen years or so and the specific policies that we might be able to do to encourage transition encourage appropriate conservation. I mean, I feel good that my hot water heater in Portland is not working when I am here in Washington, D.C., uh, but there are other things, I think, large and small, that we would really like benefit of your counsel so that when we finish the partisan knife fighting and we do all this stuff, we are able to move forward with things that will make a difference this next decade. And I, I appreciate your courtesy and, the, and how informative your testimony was. It was very useful.
Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming and our discussion of the role which uh, new discoveries of natural gas can play in our uh, energy and climate change legislative deliberations in our country. And uh, I'm uh, looking around and I'm not seeing any members, so I will recognize myself, which is the prerogative of the Chair. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, Honda has some of the best engineers in the world. I find it interesting that after building a compressed natural gas passenger vehicle, 
Honda's engineers have pursued a fuel cell passenger vehicle based initially on producing hydrogen from natural gas. Explain to the Select Committee Honda's reasoning here. Uh, was this driven by a desire to find a more efficient way to use natural gas in the transportation sector? No, the, the, the fuel Can cell. You turn on the microphone, please. It should be on. Um, our, our fuel cell vehicle uses co um, compressed hydrogen simply because that right now that, that's the best option uh, for powering a, a fuel cell vehicle. We looked at all the other ways of doing it, and uh, at least the certain cur current states of technology, that was the best. And is, if you're using compressed hydrogen, then there are a lot of things you can learn from compressed natural gas. Uh, both from the customer side, how they respond to refueling, and re especially re refueling at home. We see the, the home refueling stations as a way to help break the chicken and egg problem that you have with new technologies and, and new fuels. And it's very interesting in that this home refueling is very similar for both natural gas and for hydrogen. So there's just a, a lot of similarities there, and so we've been continuing our natural gas program. And one of the advantages of that is that we get experience that we think will translate into fuel cells. Now, can you talk a little bit about this um, heat electricity um, product that you have that people can purchase in their homes? How many, how many have you sold in the United States? Uh, so far in the U.S., it's probably uh, double digits. But this is something that we have been selling in Japan. So more than nine. More than nine, <laughs> yeah. Um, but we, we have been selling this uh, similar product in Japan since 2003 or 2004, and we sold 70,000. 70,000 of them in, in, in Japan. Japan. And they're in residence, uh, residences? Yes, they're uh, mm -hmm. primarily. Uh, they and small is businesses. there a tax break for that in, um, in Japan? I, I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. D would it be advisable for us to have a tax break here in the United States to encourage people to move in that direction? The, in general, Honda you know, th thinks that temporary near-term incentives can be uh, really helpful in getting a new technology started mm -hmm. um, so that you yeah, know that that could be something that could help jump start it here in the u.s okay is there a difference between the receptivity in the J japanese market and the u.s market or is it just that you focused on japan first and yes. you're just breaking it to double digits here because of a later start yeah it's, it's it, we've just started in the u.s and we're starting in northeast there is uh, probably one major difference between Japan and U.S., and that is the complexity of the regulatory structure, where in Japan, basically, you work it out with one, you know, one place, and you have the whole country covered, and here you have uh, every utility, and, uh, and every state has different rules. So you can sell the electricity back into the grid in Japan? Yes. Yeah, and you can't really easily do no. that in the United States. No, is that a law we have to change here, to move to uh, net metering? I, I don't think it's, it, it's, it doesn't necessarily uh, require a law. Certainly a law would help stream thing, streamline things. But the utilities and the PUC certainly have the ability to allow it and set it up without that. Right, but. Uh, yeah, they're not. But. Except for the fact that they're not. Right. Um, if you leave aside the fact that they're not, do you think an, an, a law would help? Yeah, it, it would certainly help. There's a, a major. If there was a law that actually allowed for net metering across the whole country, and you sold 70,000 units in Japan right now. How many units do you think you could sell in the United States? I, I, I can't answer that. What, one of the problems you have is that- You're not in the business development sector I, of, I, uh, <laughs> of Honda, are you? Mr. Mr. McClendon would have answered that question, see, okay? Yeah, see, uh, Honda, made the, Honda made the mistake of sending an engineer here. So, <laughs> Um, and I understand. Okay, so I, but, but my it, time, my it, time is okay. It, it is a unique product. And no, I, yeah. Anytime you have a unique product, you have a consumer education uh, process that you have to go through to get them comfortable with it. Okay, just I won't be throwing bigger watermelons across the plate uh, for, the, for uh, the rest of the day. Let me uh, turn and recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I got some questions for Mr. McClendon. Um, are you, are you, uh, can, can you speak about the outlook for Barnett Shale and Marcellus Shale? And uh, is there adequate pipeline capacity to market, to, mar to market the Barnett Shale production? Sure, let me give you some context here. The Barnett produces about four BCF a day out of about 53 BCF produced in the U.S. right now. So about seven or eight percent of the nation's gas, largest gas field in the country. 
The Marcellus you referred to is a formation that underlies Pennsylvania, New York, and, and parts of West Virginia. Um, there is sufficient pipeline uh, capacity now, uh, but as uh, production increases both in those two areas and also in the Woodford in, in Oklahoma and uh, in the Haynesville in Louisiana, we're going to have to build more pipelines. But uh, the industry has the financial ability to do that. We have the responsibility to do that, and, and we will. And what, what is the break-even point for gas shale? Today, I believe the break-even price using Henry Hub pricing is somewhere around $8 per MMBTU for the natural gas industry. That includes some return on investment, and that's why I think that the range of prices for natural gas will, over the next, uh, let's call it three to five years, average between 9 to $11 uh, per MMBTU. And uh, are you currently considering exploring in areas of Pennsylvania that were under drilling moratorium uh, that were lifted by Governor Rendell? Uh, we have operation, or leasehold rather, all across Pennsylvania. We are drilling there today. We were not affected by the previous uh, moratorium, but um, we are now affected by one in New York, um, which has been passed by the governor in the past uh, couple of weeks um, that uh, has shut down Marcellus drilling in New York until further environmental impact uh, work has been uh, completed. Thank you very much. And Mr. German, how, how, many, how many cars are you guys making right now, the, the ones that dedicated uh, uh, in NGVs a year? Yeah, it, it's, it's um, since we introduced it in, in 97, we've sold about 7,500. Uh, currently, the demand has spiked with the spike in gas prices. Uh, we, we can't currently keep up with it, so some will have to evaluate uh, increasing the sales in the future. How but but it's, it's been averaging less than 1,000 a year so far. How much do they cost? It's $25,000 which is about a $7,000 increment over a comparable Civic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. you rest your case. Natural gas that speaks for itself. You know, um, uh, the uh, gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that uh, on Monday I had the uh, privilege of attending a, a special hearing that was held between Republicans and Democrats in New Orleans. And the subject matter was energy independence and security. And a lot of the issues were talked about here. But <clears throat> I am still um, kind of concerned about the comments that Mr. Smith made regarding um, our inability to open up more opportunities to drill when in fact uh, the, the facts are that we do have about 68 million acres that are available in the National uh, Preserve, uh, Petroleum Reserve uh, that's available that we're, not, uh, that we're not really taking advantage of. Those are already available. There's leases, there's permits. Um, I, don't, I haven't heard of any major environmental uh, problems that have come up to restrict any further uh, opportunities there. Uh, in fact, um, several years ago, uh, one of the refinery companies in, uh, in Arizona and in Yuma, uh, to be more exact, uh, asked for permits and they were issued and the company there decided not to go forward and as a result of costs, not environmental costs, but costs uh, that they thought wouldn't be profitable so they didn't go ahead and build their refinery. With, with uh, respect to the Outer Continental Shelf, uh, we have passed legislation in the past two years to allow for drilling, and in fact, that was something that was done by this Congress. And uh, I don't understand uh, why there's this insistence that we continue to have this dependence on, on fossil fuel when we know that um, it is, it's detrimental, it's limited. There should be other uh, ways of looking at alternative uh, fuel and technology. And my question uh, at that debate, and would be for you, is what is the, uh, petroleum companies doing to invest in renewable technologies. I mean, obviously, uh, you're, you're up against uh, many financial factors as well, in terms of having the adequate equipment and the, and the workforce and what have you, but what, what are we looking at down the line so that we can really kind of cut our dependency on, on what happens in the Middle East and geopolitical matters that we're never going to be able to control? Um, so I, I would like to have a, a response. Well, I think that's a very appropriate and good question. Natural gas is, uh, as, as you know, the really the silent partner 
to renewable energy. It's the thing that takes renewable energy from uh, a vision to a reality. Today, wind power provides 0.77% of our electricity demand, and it has the potential to grow uh, uh, quite a bit more. Solar is about 0.01% of our electrical demand today, or electrical production. When, you, when utilities build new production or new capacity for natural gas and, or, or for, for wind and solar, they want to be able to ensure their customers that when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, that they can still produce electricity for homes and for businesses. And so natural gas is that source of power that gets built as the intermittent source that backs up those renewable supplies of energy. So it's not an either or. Uh, natural gas is the is the partner to renewable energy as we move towards a re more renewable future. But you didn't answer my question, though. What kinds of investments can your industry make to help, or is there any d talk about that? I mean, that's what's disturbing to me. We're in a recession. We have high unemployment. We have people paying outrageous amounts for their energy, their their electricity, and it's going to get worse. And in places like mine in California. Uh, it's it's unstoppable. Right. Um, we're, we're seeing a, a, a little relief, 20 cents. That that doesn't make it. And and people need to step up to the plate and take responsibility. I'm glad to hear there are other sources uh, of energy that we can look at. And and gas. I agree. Uh, liquefied natural gas is, is something that we should be looking at. But it needs to be done also in a very safe manner because the placement of facilities in communities. Uh, there was there was a project that was going to be placed in East Los Angeles. And many in the community were very alarmed uh, because they were not notified appropriately about what, what uh, elements were being taken into consideration, safety, first responders, who's responsible if there is something, an accident, um, who's going to you know, be liable for much of that. So those are some of the questions I have also. I'm not turning it off, but I'm saying that I think there is, there is an important uh, factor there because there aren't a lot of regulations on the books also that talk about protecting uh, where sightings are. And I don't even know if that's where, where we need to go on this, because uh, we import a lot of our, of, of our, our, our natural gas. Um, but, I, but I think that it's something that we're going to have to talk about as well. Yeah. Great gentlelady's time has expired. Um, chair recognizes the uh, gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Rosas Sandler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, thank the witnesses. Um, I support uh, increased domestic production of natural gas. Uh, on the Outer Continental Shelf as well as on public lands. I think technology has brought us a long way to look at some unconventional uh, ways of, of extracting this resource in an environmentally sound way. Um, you know, it's all about how the mix of incentives uh, that we set forth for the different energy sources that I think all should be on the table as we move forward to meet the nation's energy needs. Um, one of the areas I wanted to explore, Mr. German, was an area you didn't get a chance to talk about in your uh, opening remarks, but is in your written testimony, and that's biogas. Uh, so with non-fossil renewable methane gas, whether it's coming from cellulosic biomass, whether it's coming from sewage and other organic material, if you could just explain for the committee, uh, describe for us the current state of the technology for turning biogas into liquid fuel for use in conventional vehicles, and what more Congress can do to help advance uh, renewable biogas. But the, you know, the current source that's already being utilized to some extent is natural gas that's produced as uh, landfills deteriorate, and it's just a matter of capturing it. Um, a lot more could be done with that, but that supply is inherently limited. You know, we should try to take advantage as much as we can, but it's never going to be a, a large percentage uh, of the fuel that's produced. The more interesting case is from cellulosic feedstocks, where uh, a lot of work has been going into that. It is recognized that uh, cellulose um, should have much lower greenhouse gas emissions and much lower energy needs than trying to produce um, ethanol from, from, uh, from starches, for example. Uh, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done on the development of that process, and it's by no means certain that fermentation of cellulosic is going to work better than some other processes. And if gasification proves to be a better solution in the long run, now you could have a very large supply of renewable biogas. So now the question comes, what do you do with this biogas? 
You can either take it through another step and liquefy it, or you can use it directly, perhaps in natural gas vehicles. So it's just looking down, down the road, um, that uh, if, if gasification of, of uh, cellulosic feedstocks becomes uh, feasible, then that could be a major boost to uh, compressed natural gas vehicles. We certainly do hope it becomes feasible. And I'll get, Mr. Manning, I want to hear from you as well. As you may know, in uh, the Farm Bill, a uh, different committee on which I sit, the Agriculture Committee, we took important steps to facilitate research and development of cellulosic biofuels. And we do hope that uh, working with USDA and the Department of Energy that we'll see the types of advancements made to make it commercially available uh, to uh, consumers across the country. And I think there are some additional steps that Congress can take um, in that regard. Mr. Manning, did you have a comment? Very quickly, our company was the first to capture methane off a landfill in Staten Island probably 30 years ago. Um, and uh, I just, you're exactly where you need to be. And of course, there's the opportunity with agricultural waste, uh, animal waste, but there's also the opportunity to use the whole chicken, for lack of a better word. And I right. recently, uh, met last week with Tyson's, and Tyson's were taking you through what they're doing. So right. I think it's still very early days. Uh, I think it's also very interesting when coming from an urban environment like we do, the tipping fees, the, 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 um, the refuse fees for mm -hmm. large cities in this city, in this country, are enormous. So there should be a tremendous opportunity for Congress, I would think, to look at that as a very real option. And as you say, as you know, the components, the methane uh, components are quite, quite practical. Right. So uh, it's there's a whole uh, array of options. But, but part of the issue that we face, if I could just finish, is transmission. In other words, getting it from right. the farm That's right. to the load, getting it from the solar desert to the load, getting natural gas moved around. Transmission is a critical issue for Congress. We've been trying to build a pipeline that will repower a number of power plants in the New York area for six years without success. All federal approvals in place, and we were defeated. And that would just immediately back out the use of oil for, for natural gas. So that's a very important Well, I appreciate as well. your comments. And uh, my time's almost expired. But you know, where I'm from, we don't, say we don't say use the whole chicken. We say we use the whole plant. You know, corn ethanol gets a bad rap. But there's a lot of agricultural waste when you're talking about corn harvest. And whether it's corn stover, whether it's the corn cob, there's a whole host of opportunities here for us technologically. And I couldn't agree with you more on transmission, whether it's the siting of pipelines and the construction of those pipelines, or the siting of energy corridors to get the vast amounts of wind uh, and solar that we have in certain parts of the country transmitted to more populated areas. So I thank you all uh, for your testimony. I yield back. Great. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McClendon. Uh, I think, based on your testimony, I think you would agree that, that uh, while uh, natural gas is, is, is much cleaner, it is finite. And I think you mentioned we may have uh, uh, supplies for 100 years. Um, 118 a day, and that's at least in my way of thinking. Uh, but we'll, we'll all be gone, but <laughs> when it runs out, I, most, most of you. Well, I mean, that's 118 years on what we know today with the technology that we have today on the resources that we have found. So uh, it's a pretty in, in, uh, ingenious uh, human species that we are, and I would think uh, in 50 years from now we'll find more gas and we'll find more ways to get the more, a higher percent, a higher recovery factor out of these shales that, we're in right, that we are drilling into right now. The, 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 the point I, I want to make along those lines is um, while I, I agree with your, your testimony, and, and I also think that we're not probably not uh, moving uh, fast enough uh, toward using uh, natural gas in, 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 in any number of ways. But my, my concern is that concern, it, it is invasive when we extract it. What, how do you compare uh, the, the process of getting nat, nat, natural gas uh, with uh, uh, fossil fuel, well, both are fossil fuels, but oil, uh, in terms of their impact on the environment? Well, when you talk about invasive, I think about a weed that, you know, takes over the, the country. And I think uh, the good news today is that the natural gas that we're finding in these shales is being found, frankly, underneath gas fields that have already been in production 
for decades, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas. And so these are places where people are comfortable with additional drilling. Um, Pennsylvania is, a, is, the play, is the cradle of the American oil industry, 1859. So I, I wouldn't agree that we are uh, an invasive species. Um, we are certainly drilling in more areas today, but I think the good news is 33 of the 50 American states do produce. And I would say that if you're looking at the total environmental impact of natural gas versus oil versus coal, that natural gas ends up being very low on the environmental impact scale. And so um, I would encourage you to think about natural gas as clean, um, as being produced today in areas where people want it to be produced, and is the key to rolling back oil prices, gasoline prices, to where they were five years ago. And I know of no other way to do that, but natural gas can do that. Um, I represent Kansas City, Missouri, but I was born and raised in Texas. Uh, went to college uh, my first year uh, in Oklahoma. The gas uh, uh, oil fields less than a mile from the house, uh, from the public housing project where I grew up. Uh, but the, the environment, the environmental issue um, is, uh, is something that I'm concerned about. Um, Many Texans probably are as confused as as uh, as me. Uh, you, you, we, you you drive down the highway, and you'll see flames coming out of the ground, just flames with um, uh, no apparent danger. Uh, my assumption is that 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 is natural gas. My assumption that it would be illegal. Um, our country, our, our company operates 38,000 wells, um, the largest number in the country, and we're not allowed to flare gas anywhere in the United States. So um, you, you, uh, I really need you to think about in the environmental balance sheet, natural gas is the fuel that can back out dirtier oil, back out dirtier coal, and then on a net net basis, we are much ahead by using natural gas. And even so you have never seen the the, the flames. Uh, I've seen them in pictures, and I know that in the Middle East today and in Nigeria today, they flare a lot of natural gas. But in the states where we operate, we're not allowed to flare natural gas, and we're the biggest producer of gas in Texas. So that is news to me that you can flare gas in Texas. Again, maybe a long time ago, I think you probably could. But well, you're suggesting that I'm old? I mean, Pardon me? <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm, I mean, you know, you're not any older than I am, I don't think, and, uh, you know, things have changed a lot uh, in our lifetimes. Well, sure. yeah, I haven't seen the last few years because I, I don't live there, but I, uh, and maybe it's, it's a practice that has been discontinued. It really has. In Maine, I mean, for a lot of reasons, not the least of which for environmental reasons, but also it, why would you flare something that's as valuable as natural gas today? Well, we that was the, it and sell it. Yeah, that was the point I was going to make. That was the question I was going to ask uh, uh, about environmental damage and also wasting. All right, that's, uh, I yield back to balance, balance my time. Great. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Uh, uh, there was, I think, a discrepancy in a couple of testimony. I want to see if we can clear up. I think Mr. German. Had, in his testimony, he had provided a graph showing CO2 emissions reductions associated with natural gas, and it was well to wheeled emission reductions. And it shows CO2 reductions, as I read it, about 42 percent or something in that. Is that about right, Mr. German? Am I reading that? that that's for the Civic GX compared to an average vehicle. Okay. And I was reading, Mr. I think, Mr. Manning's testimony that quoted a figure of 90 to 95 percent reduction. I, as I understand it, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Uh, that number relates to if you take old technology and convert to natural gas. In other words, the least efficient. Um, we're making reference there to to displacing ancient technology. With I see. Okay. Mr. German is comparing new to new, which is probably the better number. Got it. So we're talking about getting old vehicles off the road with brand new technology running on natural. So if we replaced, comparing new gasoline-run internal combustion fleet, a new internal combustion gasoline-powered fleet with a new internal combustion natural gas-powered fleet, the best evidence is we would reduce CO2 emissions about 40, 42 percent. Is that, or the, at least that's Honda's experience then, is that right? Well, the, the, uh, 
if you convert a larger car to natural gas, the, the savings won't be as large. The, if you converted the entire fleet, the CO2 reductions would probably be 25 to 30 percent. I'll take your word for it. I know there's a good rationale. I won't get into it. So if we were, as opposed to replacing our fleet with gasoline-powered internal combustion engines, if we replaced the whole fleet with natural gas, internal combustion engines with the same model type and, you know, size, the re CO2 reductions would be about what number? 20, 25 to 30 percent. 25 to 30 percent. Okay. Thank you. I but, appreciate but Of course, this would be on top of any technology improvements you made to the baseline vehicle. Right. Right. Which can be very significant, by the way. We're very excited about that. I just drove uh, a plug-in hybrid that Toyota has made just as kind of a prototype yesterday. And of course, um, Honda's got a lot of fuel cell progress, and GM has, I think, made a commercial decision to do a plug-in hybrid vehicle, the Volt. And I believe this is really in the near term future, the electrification, electrification of the car. And so I'm very excited about that. But we got to have the electricity, obviously, to run the cars. So I want to ask you about that. Um, we're having this debate, discussion of offshore drilling, in part for natural gas. And I want to try to ask you all about the uh, the parameters of the possible of natural gas exploration domestically compared to the potential parameters for other fuel sources. For instance, uh, I'm advised that the National Renewable Energy Lab found that if you, if you look at the land domestically that could be available just for solar technology, let's just take solar thermal technology to use thermal energy with mirrors that bounce the heat onto a pipe, you heat up salt, and you drive a steam turbine engine. They found that um, if you exclude mountain ranges, if you exclude cities, if you exclude environmentally protected areas, if you exclude areas that the grade would not allow, if you just look at the areas that are really suited for solar energy, in the American Southwest, we could produce seven times more than the entire energy usage of the United States just using solar thermal power. Now, today that would be considerably more expensive than natural gas with today's uh, situation before we enjoy scales of economy. But nonetheless, it's significant. I just met with a company that has plans to produce in America. Uh, it's it's uh, the Mon company. It's now a German company, but they tell me that they could produce that in a 90-mile area of the Southwest, you could you could produce all of the electricity the United States use and run, according to the Pacific Northwest Lab, and run the entire transportation system of the United States once cars are electrified, which I think is relatively soon. So I guess uh, looking at those f enormous potential growth. How does how does natural gas stack up as far as potential growth in the, in domestic production? Is it the same? Is it more? Is it less? Just give us some ideas in that regard, Mr. Manning. If I, if I could just take the first shot at that, the critical role of natural gas, and this has been discussed a little bit, um, is that technology when the sun goes down and the load is still maintained for a couple of hours. The best way, I mean, obviously, as you say, you have salt storage, there's other ways to do that. But a lot of the benefit of natural gas is that for, to, to accommodate intermittent power, be it wind or solar, uh, the opportunity to balance the grid, which is a critical need, uh, is, is best with natural gas generation because it can come up very quickly. Uh, large base load plants can't respond quickly. Natural gas plants can. So you could use a combination of peaking plants. This leaves aside the whole conversation about high efficiency technologies and distributing your generation, and there's lots of things that you can do. But what my friend referred to here was that this, the silent partner of, 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 of renewable power uh, is natural gas, because it can facilitate. What you're talking about is large desert solar, I mean, uh, massive installation, cover story in, in Scientific American last year. Absolutely, that opportunity is there. But natural gas, I, I do believe, still plays a major role. What we've also been speaking about is the opportunity to use natural gas in things like the free watt unit by Honda, where you can actually, natural gas is very efficient in its final use. It's, it can be very efficient at the burner tip. And so that then, of course, one of the biggest issues, the challenges that you refer to in terms of major central plant solar is transmission. How do you get that power from those large opportunities uh, into the load? And so transmission is very difficult to do. And if you, if you only want to build transmission that's just intermittent power, it's just solar or wind, 
that, which, which of course, uh, you know, I, I recognize uh, that that's that's important in, in your bill. The challenge that we have, of course, then is how you balance that load, and and that's a, an area of real challenge for for our industry. There's an answer to that, which has passed my bill on establishing a high capacity corridor. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Gentlemen's time, gentlemen's time has expired. What we'll do is we'll go to a, a, a round of uh, two-minute questioning from uh, the members. Mr. McClendon, I'd like to talk to you about water, the role that water plays in the hydraulic fracturing. Uh, New York State has just passed a law which requires there to be a consideration of the environmental impact um, that uh, this new natural gas uh, drilling will have on the water supply. Could you talk about it? I can. Uh, water cannot be separated from the discovery of natural gas any more than water can be separated from any industrial process. It is part and parcel of agriculture. It's part and parcel of industry. And we have to have a lot of water to drill our wells. Now, um, how do we go about getting that water? We operate in some of the most arid parts of the United States, uh, West Texas, Western Oklahoma, places with less than 10 inches of rain. Um, we do a good job of building uh, collection dams for water in, in those areas. We use municipal water. Um, and in New York State and Pennsylvania, there's a, a fair amount of stream water that we think we can access. Um, we will have to work with the Susquehanna uh, Water District, the Delaware Water District, and uh, other water districts. But um, we're just like any other industry that comes to an area and wants to set up shop. Uh, to create jobs, we're going to have to have uh, water, and uh, we'll be responsible users of that water. Okay, great. Um, and I think it's going to be a big issue for uh, us to have to deal with this water issue. It's not unlike the um, corn, ethanol, food issue. You know, you you wind up with a tension, and I think we're going to have a tension here in water, and we're going to have to uh, get down to the bottom of it and uh, create a policy. Uh, one final question: Yes and no. You were good to uh, do the outer continental shelf uh, drilling issue, and each of you expressed a lack of expertise in it. That's subject material. So I'm going to give you another issue uh, uh, pending before the Senate right now is the extension of the renewable tax credit. Uh, we passed it through the House four times. Um, should the Senate pass the renewable tax credit before we adjourn this year and uh, put it on the President's desk, Mr. McClendon? I don't know really anything about it, um, so. Um, but I'm you you said earlier you wanted all assets on it, so this is how to get the asset out <laughs> well, there. My, I'm just there to provide the firm foundation underneath renewables. And <laughs> okay. Okay. The market uh, wants renewables. Okay. How about you, Mr. Smith? Who pays for it? Well, the American taxpayer. Same people who give the tax breaks to our industry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Who else? I, I would ask, well, it, with the prices we have today for energy, why aren't those sources of energy competitive on their own? That's what we're saying about the natural gas tax breaks, the oil tax breaks, you know? So thank you for raising that issue. Um, Mr. Harris? Yes, a uh, unqualified yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Manning? Unqualified yes, and it should be a top priority. Thank you. Mr. Wells? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. That, uh, that completes my time. We'll recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you. Um, I am curious if any of you have some thoughts or observations about, as we're as we're dealing with the primary role that coal is playing now and is going to probably continue to play for the foreseeable future, even with natural gas as a transition. If there is some potential in your judgment for some of the technologies uh, to uh, uh, create uh, gas in the coal, coal seams, uh, some of the processing that is underway, uh, sort of dealing with the combination of carbon sequestration and uh, conversion in a way that um, appears to have some promise. Mr. Wells? Yeah, excellent question. And, and as part of our efforts to diversify our sources of energy, today we, for pure energy, are about 99 percent dependent on natural gas, are looking into the gasification of coal into natural gas. And we've got several projects that we're working with partners around the United States looking at deploying that. Great. And as part of that gasification process, you do produce a, a pure stream of CO2, which makes the potential for carbon sequestration much easier. Mr. McClendon. My opinion is it's uh, completely unnecessary. Um, you have a, uh, an inferior molecular product in the form of coal. You're trying to turn it into a superior molecular project, product in the form of natural gas. Nobody's trying to coalify gas, and there's a reason for it. 
gas in a superior environmental product to coal. People want to gasify coal for a reason. Once you're done, you've still got a lump of carbon over there that you've got to get rid of. So I would, I would ask Congress to spend more time thinking about how to enhance the production of the superior molecular product, natural gas, as opposed to spending billions of dollars on uh, ga coal gasification. Well, there are, there are people who are using the technology, as I understand it, uh, developed by um, Hitler and Stalin uh, that uh, looks promising in terms of actually being able to sequester that carbon, but you think not. Uh, I sure haven't seen okay. it. I noticed that Congress uh, killed uh, most of their funding for that uh, research uh, earlier this year. Well, it, was the, it was the President that pulled the plug on it. Now, it was not Congress. Okay, we put money behind it because we were trying to have a balance, okay. and the administration killed it. The gentleman's time has expired. Can I just see if anybody else okay. has some thought I can on gasification? Yeah, just a, a quick comment on that. Basically, in countries where the coal gasification is uh, utilized is in countries where there is no domestic uh, source of natural gas, basically. Great. Okay. Thank you. I recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I mentioned uh, the, the D.C. Bus, buses uh, with the signs, natural gas. What any of you, um, how much do you think we can uh, do to um, uh, create a higher level of natural gas usage in vehicles? Uh, what, what, what amount of uh, <clears throat> natural gas that, that is available could we um, uh, inject into the, 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 the market right now? Uh, to power uh, vehicles. If, if I could just start, it, uh, I don't have the, I can't quantify that immediately, but what I can tell you is that Long Island bus has 400 buses, 100 percent committed. It, they did it when it was not economic to do so. They did it in large measure with incentives from the company and from the State and from the Federal Government a number of years ago. Now it probably makes good economic sense. Now they are ahead of the game. As I indicated, there is a lot of interest right now. We are probably about a third or over a third of the buses in, in the Massachusetts uh, area are now converted to natural gas. It is a money issue. Um, there, there, was, there is competing technology in diesel hybrids. Uh, one of the numbers that we did have in our testimony is that you have a 99 percent reduction in particulate when you have a natural gas vehicle bus. The beauty of buses, of course, is it is centrally fueled. So that we are big fans of natural gas vehicles, but our success has been where they're centrally fueled, such as buses. So, but what we had to do, we built 17 gas depots in New York City. We built 15 in Boston, and we included we were we built the Jackie Gleason bus garage for three million dollars two decades ago to force the MTA's <laughs> hand to get them to do this. They've had a, a bit of a love affair with diesel hybrid. Now they're coming back to natural gas. It may be a price issue, but um, it. it it's it's a money issue, but it's it's there. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, Mr. McClendon has to leave. I, we usually ask the witnesses to give us a one minute summation. So before I recognize Mr. Inslee, could you give us your one minute before you run out to do it? Certainly. Um, my one minute would be as you all go home for recess. I hope that you take back the message to your constituents that you have a plan that can lower their gasoline costs in half. That you can allow them. Uh, to drive environmentally more friendly cars and that you can allow them to use a product that creates American jobs as it's consumed and use a product that enhances national, national security. Natural gas does all that. And this industry can increase natural gas production by at least 5 percent per year for at least the next decade. Please think about your policies with regard to natural gas with a mind frame of abundance rather than scarcity. Great. Thank you, Mr. McClendon, very much. Chair, thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. Um, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inns. Yes, a question for the whole panel. Are any of you opposed to the adoption of a cap and trade system to limit the amount of global warming gases emitted and have a permit system for those who are emitting them? Are any of you opposed to the adoption of such a system? No one is opposed? I think the devil is in the details, right? Uh, you, uh I think everyone would want to see the details of, of that plan before they blindly said yes. 
Well, do you think, Mr. Smith, do you think we ought to have a national limitation on our emissions of global warming? And do you think we ought to have a permit system that polluters pay for to, to pollute? I think one in five Americans today currently qualify for energy assistance and they're struggling to, to pay their heating and electricity bills, they're struggling to get to work, they're str struggling to pay for their food. And uh, I think uh, you need to ask the American public if that's their highest priority is to make energy more expensive or if there's more creative market-based approaches to help lower the price of uh, energy while also reducing carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases. So do you think polluters should pay to pollute in this country? I mean, let me tell you, I ask you, when you go to the garbage dump and you unload your pickup load of stuff, I bet you they charge you 10 to 20 bucks to do that where you live. You're shaking your head yes. So do you think that under industries that use our one atmosphere as a refuge dumping spot should have to pay for the right to use that as a garbage dump? I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I understand. Uh, I think generally what you're saying or what you're asking me is, should there be a cost to pollute? And I, I would agree with that. That's probably, that's probably fair. I appreciate that. We'll remind you that next year when we're working on this cap and trade system. <laughs> Thanks. Well, that completes the um, the time for questions. So we'll go to the summation of. Um, of uh, each of our witnesses, one minute apiece, what uh, the big thought is that you want us to remember as we move forward legislatively. Mr. Smith. Thank you. Well, it's clear from the testimony today that energy drives our economy, and we've heard compelling reasons why we meet, need more natural gas for transportation, for food, for feedstocks, and for electricity. Uh, natural gas, especially for off of federal lands, is a critical supply today, and it looks like it will be for quite some time. Uh, it's proven. It's a near-term solution, and we uh, we can't kick the road uh, the can down the road anymore on deciding whether or not these areas should be open for development. It, it will just be delaying those problems for future gen generations. And I hope this Congress will look at opening uh, the OCS and providing better, more timely access for uh, uh, development in the Intermountain West. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Yeah, I think I uh, would uh, like to close by saying uh, global warming and uh, energy security are issues we should address and believe the way to address those issues are access to resources and the ability to build the infrastructure necessary to bring those resources to the marketplace and also import LNG and other products that will diversify our energy uh, supply. Mr. Manning. We have made an 80 percent commitment to reduce climate change emissions by 2050. We're 37 percent of the way there. Uh, I was a delegate to Kyoto in 1997 for 13 days. Uh, we've been working on this file now since about 1994, by my recollection, in terms of strategies. We think that this could be a critical component, the work that you're doing today. We think that gas is a critical facilitator, the technologies that we'll need to do that. We would encourage you to give us a set of rules so that we can invest in a set of rules, probably involving cap and trade, and that kind of certainty will drive that kind of investment, which we believe will allow us to lose, use less fuel. Natural gas is a precious commodity. It facilitates a great deal of technological change. We should use it wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wells. Thank you. I sit here today representing a solutions provider to a lot of the issues that we talked about today. Uh, my company alone develops products like uh, styrofoam insulation, which that product alone saves over 200 million metric tons of CO2 each year. You mentioned in your opening the lightweight plastics that, that get to be used in automobiles, allow them to be more efficient. Um, we talked about landfill gas. We've been a pioneer in the use of landfill gas. Just last week we signed a, an agreement with NREL to use plant waste that, that leads toward, um, towards uh, ethanol and towards uh, auto fuels. But we sit on the natural gas margin. And as, as natural gas prices will rise, as demand increases, we'll be the industry that leaves. We want to invest in the U.S. We want to provide these solutions to the U.S. by being in the U.S. And we ask for policy that allows us to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Mr. German. Yes. Um, hi. It, there's certainly um, our needs are great. We need to pursue multiple, avenue, multiple avenues to meet our transportation needs. 
Uh, natural gas is, has a lot of potential to be a significant part of the near-term solution, but there's a lot of other potential solutions in the long term. Need to avoid mandates, set performance standards, let the best technologies win in the long term. Of course, this assumes equal playing fields to different technologies, and along those lines, we would like to work with the committee on how to address selling electricity from our free watt system back to the grid. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, very much. We thank uh, each of you. Obviously, if uh, the predictions come to pass, um, this is an incredible development. Um, some of our witnesses are maintaining that there could be a doubling of natural gas production in the United States over the next 10 years. Uh, if that's true, it's incredible news. Um, right now, we produce about 8 million barrels of oil per day in the United States, about 11 million barrels of oil equivalent in uh, natural gas, and about 10 million barrels of oil equivalent in coal. If natural gas could be used to substitute for coal uh, in the eventuality that a carbon capture and sequestration plan is not in place over the next 10 years, if natural gas could be used to displace oil in the vehicles which we drive, uh, obviously in the both in both uh, global warming and in energy independence, uh, there is something quite big as an ingredient which is being added to the formula. We thank you for being witnesses at our first hearing on this subject. Uh, I think it is going to rise in prominence uh, as each month uh, passes uh, as we try to put in place the policies to solve these problems. Uh, with that, this hearing is adjourned with the thanks of the committee.